So I spent some time redesigning my landing page for my scary story generator. And one of the things I brought in was a parallax effect where I'm going to show you a library that I use in React to achieve this. It's actually pretty cool. You scroll and you can see that the background scrolls at a different pace than the actual like foreground. Quick overview, I basically have the landing page with the parallax view. I have an example video that you can watch with some subtle background image. Scroll down some more, I got a how it works page with some subtle animations. And I got a pricing page with some nice hover effects on the cards and that's about it. So that's my current setup for my landing page. I might add some more stuff later, but I think this is good enough. But how did I achieve the parallax? So going to my hero component, you'll see that I basically have this parallax component, which is bringing in something called React Parallax. Let's go over to NPM and kind of check this out. So here is the package. And it's actually very, very simple to get this set up. You literally just put this parallax component and then whatever content you actually want inside of the container would just go there. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I need you to load the city image. So if I type city, it looks like this. And by the way, I just used um, replicate to generate this. So I went into replicate. I said, generate me a spooky, scary city with like some fog. And that's what it gave me. I also gave it an input image as some direction that it could take to understand what I'm talking about. And I got this, okay. And then I gave it some strength. So strength is basically like, how much do you want this thing to scroll as you are scrolling? So if you put it high, Notice that it kind of like scrolls faster. Um, and I just had to play around with this number until I found something that looked pretty good. I think 200 worked well. All right, so it's like a subtle transition. And then some other stuff you can put here is you can add opacity to the image. So if you want it to be a little bit more uh, darker, you could do that. But I think five or six was like the good, good medium right there. Keep it as five. And that's about it. If you scroll a little bit down, this is the content of the page. So this is all the stuff that'll be inside of it. So that should all kind of make sense to you. Some other finishing touches I added to the site is when you scroll down a little bit, you'll notice that the top header goes from transparent to a, a darker like actual shade. And I've seen this approach in many websites and I'll kind of walk you through how I did that too if you're interested. Again, all this code is closed source. I'm not opening this up. So you'll just have to like understand what I've showed you. Basically we have a header here and we keep track of when the user is scrolling. So I just add an event listener for scrolling and then I remove it. And when you scroll over zero, so like the user scrolls just a little bit, we go ahead and set a Boolean to true. And then when they get back up to the top, we set it back to false. And if has scrolled is true, we basically just change the background to be a more solid color. Otherwise we make it transparent. Also adding a little duration here and a transition just makes it kind of slowly fade in, which is something that you should kind of understand how to do in CSS. So some other things that were added in, um, let's look at the how it works. It has like a little fade in effect. This is a Tailwind class that's built in. Basically you just say animate pulse and that'll animate your titles and whatever you want. Uh, I don't know if I even like it pulsing, so I might just remove that, honestly. Kind of distracting, especially since there's already animations here, which I kind of like. So let's look at some of these. How are these working? Let's go find the craft, your nightmare. We got an array of three steps and these steps are mapped over. We have a step card. Okay. And looking at how this kind of works, I believe we have like a get animation class. Okay. So all of these steps have an animation class. So scrolling down, this basically is going to look up classes that are defined and it's going to apply them to the cards here. Okay. And they have like different speeds and stuff. So animate float slow. Let's go and look at my global CSS and find animate float slow. All this is doing is calling a float slow over eight seconds, doing an ease in and out and infin infinitely doing it. So where's float slow? The way animations work in CSS is you typically make a class that calls an animate. And then you have keyframes that are defined up here. The keyframes are where you can kind of specify from a range of zero to hundred percent what is going to happen over that like that timeline okay so if you imagine there's like a timeline it goes from zero to 100 and then if you have infinite down here it just loops back to the front and so what we're saying here is when you start off you're going to be at y of zero so like just keep it stationary and then when the timeline's running it's going to move up 20 pixels and that's the 50 percent mark and then back down at 100 percent it's going to hit zero again so it basically just makes it go up and down super simple but it's cool to understand how these work in css because they're pretty powerful when you can get more advanced stuff so another cool animation i found online is this flashing font one um, if we actually go here and add it 
to the H1, let me just make it over like 0.32 seconds, uh, you'll see that this is the effect that it does. Maybe that's kind of uh, not really accessible. It's kind of annoying. It's, it's kind of cool what you can do with animations. I mean, you can like change the position of your CSS, the scaling, you can make stuff blur out. So doing something like this uh, is pretty cool. I think also adding it to the background um, would be cool to do, but I'm not sure if I can actually achieve that. Yeah, the moment I add it to like the parallax, it just like, it breaks. Um, but originally it was in the background to give it a cool like, you know, the background's like phase, phasing in and out. Yeah, sometimes um, animations are hit or miss, right? Sometimes you don't want to add too many animations to your site because it just makes it look worse. Um, and it's also like distracting. So I would say only add animations to the things that you want people's eyes to be drawn to. Don't add them to things that are just like for fun. Some other things I can kind of talk about is how do I get these images? Well, again, I used Replicate. So go to Replicate. And for example, here is um, one of the ones I generated. I said inside a creepy dark tunnel, lights in center. And if you go to, I think, my Generate page, you'll see that that is the background of this page. Now, typically, I don't use like background images on sites because A, they're slow to load. But in terms of like the theme of this site, I think it just adds like an extra bit of character to the site. Um, again, I'm not a UX expert or a designer, but so how does Replicate work? Again, you type in a prompt. One thing you can do is you can actually add a source image. So I found this image online and obviously I can't just copy and paste an image because of copyright issues. But if you use a source image and change up a prompt a little bit, you can get something very similar, but different. Okay, so like technically this is not copywritten because it's a completely different image. And it kind of just looks a little bit better, right? And so some other things you can do down here is you can change the width and the height. So I changed the width to be double the height so that it's more of like a, you know, a typical like 1080p type of layout. Um, you can change different things. Schedulers, if you don't know much about uh, Stable Diffusion, there's different types of like algorithms that are used under the hood. You can get different results based on your schedulers. Uh, typically, you can just keep it as Keyuler. But you can also increase your inference steps. Usually there's like a sweet spot of where this needs to be, but it's going to cost you more money the larger it is and it's going to take more time. So like, so the idea is you keep it kind of low at front, you do some runs, see if you get some good results, and then you bump it up to like 30 or 40 or 50 until you get something that's a lot more like well-designed. Okay, and then you can go down here, you can change like the prompt strength. So the higher this is, the more it's really going to look into this prompt you typed in and try to give you accurate results. If you drop the prompt strength down to like zero, it's just going to give you a random image that might not even be related to a creepy tunnel. Um, again, this is Replicate. It just, you can sign up and you can do a bunch of like awesome stable diffusion stuff. I'm using SDXL, which is one of the recent models that a lot of people have been using. I know Flex is a new one that people talk about, but this one works pretty good for my needs. I'm trying to think what else I could talk about in this, this site. You know, just trying to give you little nuggets of information that would be useful. One thing I added in, and I highly recommend you find um, how to add this into to your sites, is when you're dealing with building out and designing websites, typically when you have to do different breakpoints, it could be kind of annoying to figure out like when a breakpoint's happening. So on the bottom right of the screen, you'll notice that it goes from extra large to large. I added this little thing to help me visualize like when stuff starts getting bad. Like right here, I can tell that on a medium breakpoint, stuff gets a little squashed in the header. So how did I add this component? Um, if I go to the layout, Actually, I think I just go here, breakpoint indicator. Super simple. You basically just have your breakpoints that match your Tailwind CSS breakpoints. And then um, you hide and show stuff based on those breakpoints. Now, there might also be another way to do this. Like, I could probably do this all just using Tailwind class breakpoints. Um, but I'll be honest, I use Cursor to generate this. It took five seconds to create. And now I'm using it on my app to help me debug. Anyway, I'm looking forward to uh, just giving you little updates on this application as I'm building it out. I just wanted to take some time to like redo the site, make it look a little bit nicer, and then circle back and actually make the generate functionality uh, locked in. Because the other pages of the site, they look a little bit rough. I need to come back in here and just like redesign them and make them look good. Um, yeah, that's about it. Hope you guys enjoyed watching this and have a good day. Happy coding.